black holes and dark matter, dark energy, I feel very attracted, in fact, seduced by these concepts because they are mysterious. And in many ways, they define the edge of what we know. So, uh, Priya, you've had a remarkable career. You're uh, now the uh, Professor of Astronomy and Physics at Yale. We've won lots of awards for your work. And uh, you, uh, time has recently chosen you as amongst the top 100 most influential people uh, in the world. And as far as you're concerned, in terms of the ideas you put forward, in terms of the influence you've had, which of those do you think, from your point of view, is, has been the most significant? So I, I think, obviously, right one um, often feels um, more attached to some ideas than others. Scientists are meant to be completely agnostic, right? They're supposed to be objective and not emotionally attached to their ideas. But you know, we are human, so one is attached. And I guess for me, it is this most recently validated idea, the fact that there ought to be more than one way to make the first black holes and this proposal of uh, potentially having direct collapse of gas in the very early universe, forming black holes from the get-go, sort of bypassing your idea of this traditional star, because the, uh, the original understanding, um, long-standing understanding from the time of Subramaniam Chandrasekhar has been that, you know, you have a massive star, perhaps one of the first stars in the universe, lives out its life and then explodes and leaves behind a black hole. And so those are the seed black holes from which every black hole that we see at the center of most galaxies, including our own, which are, you know, a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. So they're behemoths and that everything came from these sort of tiny seeds. And this alternative picture, which was, of course, prompted by new data. So there were these billion times the mass of the sun black holes powering these very bright sort of cosmic lighthouses, quasars that were found further and further back in time that, you know, they just they started to be a timing crunch to start from little seeds and to grow them that motivated, you know, thinking about alternative ways. So I think this idea that, you know, this whole uh, notion that there ought to be more ways that just came out of an intuitive hunch of um, <clears throat> not wanting to feel restricted, that nature must not be this restrictive, that there ought to be more ways because more and more black holes were turning up everywhere we looked, they were just there. Um, I think so this is the idea that I am most excited about, partly because of the journey of this idea. So it started with a set of papers that I wrote with a collaborator, Giuseppe Lodato in 2005, six and seven. And, you know, it didn't take very easily. The idea didn't take. And it was pretty radical in the sense that the idea itself was quite simple, but showing that there are locations in the universe where the conditions needed for direct collapse actually exist, they could exist. And then having simulations, sophisticated simulations that could test that those locations, you know, tell us a little bit more about what the properties of those locations were likely to be in our universe. Um, that took a long time. So it required, you know, persistence and patience, um, as well as, um, you know, a certain kind of conviction. So it was hard not to get attached to it because it didn't take very quickly. And people were like, oh, this is a very cute kind of, Yes, the physics is correct, it works, but it's not clear that it's real. And so, you know, it sort of became um, an exciting challenge. And, uh, and do you think that the observations of the universe uh, determine, well, uh, are always enable us to choose the correct theory? Do you think that uh, they uh, define uh, a single outcome? Or are we left with alternative accounts and we're somehow choosing between the best of alternative accounts? Right. I think in this instance, not, because it was a pretty unambiguous sets of signatures. But in general, yes. Uh, so you always have a degree of ambiguity and you have to remain open to possibilities. And I think that's one of the key features of science that 
um, can seem a bit problematic to uh, the layperson who doesn't understand how messy the scientific process is. But for me, it's uh, one of the motivations to be a scientist. The fact that all knowledge is provisional and it's kind of best to date and that it's apt to change, not always in a transformative, fundamentally transformative way, but that we have to be open-minded. Um, and as you say, right, uh, it could be this, it could be that, and it's nothing's ever quite finally settled for good. Mm. And so one of the things that you are known for is the mapping of dark matter and dark energy. Um, do you think that we know that dark matter and dark energy exist. Do you think you're, you're confident that, that that is the case? Yes, I think, uh, as I said, provisionally, as of now, given all the evidence that we have, I do believe in, and I use the word believe very carefully here and intentionally. Uh, yes, I think the overwhelming evidence is in support of existence of dark matter and dark energy. Um, and I say that because I think it's very clear how these entities manifest in the universe. So in that sense, they are absolutely real. They manifest and they have, um, they are needed in our current account of the universe. And whether the particular nature that we are ascribing to these objects, these entities, uh, is really what it is about remains to be seen. So, for example, I think dark matter is definitely uh, matter as we have come to understand it, even though it's something exotic, not anything in the periodic table that we are familiar with or anything that we are made of. But I do believe that it's a particle. Having said that, that particle has remained incredibly elusive. We've not yet found it. You know, the sun has not found it. You know, um, there have been direct detection experiments tailored for that. They haven't found it. Um, and dark energy, once again, is similarly intriguing. We know how it manifests. We know that it likely powers the accelerating expansion of our universe. We had a placeholder model. And this placeholder model we knew was apt to refinement. And recently, there has been a slight hint that maybe we believe dark energy was constant. Um, and we see some potential, very slight hint that maybe we should be more open to ideas where dark energy might evolve with time, with cosmic time in the universe. And you know, once again, you know, black holes, and dark matter, dark energy, I feel very attracted, in fact, seduced by these concepts because they are mysterious. And in many ways, they define the edge of what we know at this given time in science. So it feels particularly thrilling uh, to be working on these sort of dark entities. You know, sort of the invisible universe is incredibly fascinating. Of course, what we have are visible cues from the stars that we see and, you know, and um, the light that we get across wavelengths in the universe. But strangely, the visible universe seems to be illuminating the invisible universe. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm not a, a physicist, I'm a philosopher, and um, I would give an account of our theories as being metaphors or models that we apply to the world rather than uncovering an ultimate framework. Would you be comfortable with that? Or do you think they're more than a model that they really do you know, catch sight of the nature of, re nature of reality? Yeah, I think, um, I think there are models at different levels of sophistication for different phenomena. I would say that there are concepts um, and there are um, particular physical settings where these models uh, map on closer to reality than they do in other cases. So for example, the the kind of model that we have, the four-dimensional model for space-time itself, and the attendant phenomena that result from it, like the bending of light, for example, I think that goes beyond a conceptual model. I mean, I don't think, like the sociologists of science would say, I think atoms exist. I don't think atoms are just a good representation of whatever this table might be made of. So I think there is a difference. There are places where we use metaphors. And often those metaphors are 
are a sort of stand in for incomplete understanding, typically. And I think when our understanding evolves and gets to be more sophisticated, the resultant models, refined, honed models, really get us close to reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything about truth, capital T, though. Yeah. Yeah, because, because you're a philosopher. I know you yeah. drag me there, and I'm not <laughs> going to go there. Yeah. yeah, and in the case of atom, of course, the original notion of an atom was it was just the same thing all the way through and was indivisible. It was a point particle, or a point idea originally. Now, uh, in a way, the atom is evaporated, hasn't it? We end up with uh, the underlying particles, initially protons, neutrons, then quarks, and so forth, and. Uh, it's, it's no longer quite clear what, what, what we understood by the atom at all in the first place. You can't. So, um, while it, in one sense, you know, we all think there are atoms, uh, at another level, it's quite difficult to right. so under, I think what, under, yeah. understand what, they're really, what they really are. Right. So, I think uh, this is exactly what I meant when I said when we refine and hone a concept. And uh, in this particular case, perhaps linguistically, um, the atom, this is not when I said atoms, I didn't mean Democritus's atoms yeah. or the Indian philosophers, Anu. I really do mean Bohr's atom onwards, our evolved understanding. So you're absolutely right that um, sometimes we have these conceptual markers that sort of linguistically uh, suggest that they are metaphors, but they have come to stand for more than metaphors. I understand. So what would you say there are at the festival here, some uh, physicists who want to propose alternatives to dark energy? And I think probably one of their reasons for doing so is the thought that the proposal of dark energy is a very grand one in the sense that it's 69% of the universe. And so we've just invented an awful lot of universe with dark energy. and so. They propose alternative sort of possible accounts that gravity is functioning differently than we imagine or something or other. And what, what in general would be your, your response to those alternative yeah. stories, as it were? I think uh, it's fair game at the moment with dark energy, because as I mentioned, it's uh, what we currently have is a placeholder model. And, you know, the, we are still at a stage, you know, the discovery was just 1998. So, you know, we are still very much in the early days of understanding the sort of the rich, full phenomenology of dark energy, how all it manifests. We definitely know that there was a clear cut manifestation in terms of the detection via the supernovae data for the accelerating expansion. But I think for dark energy, it's um, it's open season at this point. And um, but you know, but whatever model that is proposed has to obviously describe what we have seen so far and understood so far, and for it to be taken seriously needs to make a prediction going forward that's testable, right? So I think as long as um, an alternative explanation satisfies those criteria, I'm totally game for that. And I think you know, similarly for dark matter, right? So I think. There have been interesting proposals, but at the moment, I have not seen anything that actually uh, encompasses the full range of observational data that we see. So, for example, there is a scalar vector tensor model, which is, you know, um, it's an offshoot of the sort of modifying gravity scenarios, modifying Newtonian dynamic scenarios. They're very, very interesting because they kind of have enormous explanatory power at the level of individual galaxies and the rotation curves, the, you know, the fact that there appears to be a lot of matter that um, provides unseen kind of support lifting the ha halos of galaxies. Um, I think the, uh, that alternative explains that incredibly well. But on the other hand, that model fails to explain uh, the bending of light that we just see everywhere. And, uh, and especially with the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, it's just completely revealed in full grandeur the predictions of general relativity and every other domain in which we have which tested. Which you've used in order to show those maps of exactly. what, what a dark matter might be. Yeah. Or, or, you know, very impressive in the sense of picturing what might be, uh, uh, what might be out there. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's, 
So we have a very acute understanding of the spatial distribution of dark matter. So the fact not just that it's material, but that if it were really material, we have a very good sense of how it's distributed. And that corresponds incredibly well to a plethora of observational data. So I think um, while I'm completely open-minded, I don't think we have a credible alternative at the moment. And what is remarkable is that our current standard sort of understanding of structure formation driven by dark matter um, is just so incredibly successful. It's just phenomenally successful. And, um, and the successes have just been kind of garnered over the last you know 30 years on a range of scales starting from the largest scales to the smaller smallest cases scales and i think there are some tensions on small scales there are tensions that are emerging and you know we are actually working on one tension that is looking kind of intriguing uh, because it needs an explanation that goes counter to all the other tensions right. Um, and so I think it remains to be seen. Um, it does look pretty secure, but you know, as scientists, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one has to be really open-minded and have to be pushing to see um, as we can see better and we can see clearer and farther into the universe. I think it offers more stringent tests of the models that we're building. And as you say, enormously exciting to be involved in that creation of our future idea of what, what we might understand of the universe. Well, it's all really very fascinating, Priya. It's been a great pleasure talking to you.